the governor of the state, Governor Wolf, and the state Supreme Court flagrantly violated the Constitution of the United States. The power to set these rules and regulations is vested in the legislatures. They just ignored that, ignoring the Constitution. Now we bring it down to the actual counting level, the counting houses, and outrageously, observers, who are the essentially the sentinels of integrity and obviously transparency, were excluded. The Trump administration, the Trump campaign, had to go into court in Philadelphia to get that basic right that the law allows. So at both the statewide level and the local level, Pennsylvania has just conducted itself in a horrible, lawless way. And hopefully this will be corrected at the Supreme Court of the United States. Everything Ken Starr said there is just a matter of fact. It's all established. It's all true. I just think it's so funny. Uh, the libs love to say, well, the poll watchers were then allowed in, but they were only allowed to be within 20 feet or something. You think you can see what's going on with ballots from 20 feet away? Anybody believe that? What, we're so worried about COVID? Not according to the block parties I saw in New York. Not according to the uh, celebrations all across the country over the weekend. All of a sudden, COVID, much less, much less a worry. We'll talk about that. It's not a surprise, I know, but I'm, I'm not going to stop pointing it out because the disgusting hypocrisy of the left with all this stuff is it's just too much to take. It really is. But Pennsylvania did something that is uh, contrary to law. Shouldn't that matter? Shouldn't we get an answer about this? And I can tell you this much. If this stuff makes its way up to the Supreme Court, do you think if there's an adverse decision of any kind that comes down from this now Supreme Court with, with the addition of, uh, of the, the latest Trump appointee to it, Amy Coney Barrett, ACB, do you think that there will be an acceptance of that decision as that's the process and it's legitimate, right? This is ultimately all about legitimacy. And unless we're willing to establish that there are rules that we all agree on, and those rules are, are political party neutral, and they are universally applicable, there's no such thing as legitimate. There's just power. There's just the raw exercise of power. So if we're going to talk about wh whether or not the, the vote means that a Biden presidency, a legitimate uh, Biden presidency is happening right now, we also talk about whether a legitimate legal challenge should be respected by the other side and possibly an adverse decision. The same courts that may decide what happened in Philadelphia is a problem. I don't know if they're going to throw out votes. I don't know what the final uh, disposition of that's going to be. But th those are the same courts we rely on to help us set up all, all kinds of things in the legal process. Right? The courts have weighed in on voter ID. The courts have weighed in on you know, moving polling places. The courts are involved in all this all the time. So I want you to remember that because the issue of legitimacy, if you rely on Democrats, they're just going to tell you that whatever they want is what is legitimate. Whatever they think is best for them is what is most true and decent and, and good. Um, now we have to get to... Uh, now we have to get to what's happening or what was happening over the weekend with these parties that were going on everywhere. Um, Gail King mentioned this on there. Play 16. I, I call it unbridled exuberance. It's, it's like, Nora, the, the country's having a nationwide block party. You can go from city to city to city and for the most part see people just jumping out of their skins. I was just there on the corner of 44th and 8th, talking 44th and Broadway, asking a police officer, so how do you think, how's it going? He goes, the night is young, but I haven't seen this many people this happy since a Yankees championship, which I think sort of... a few years in this town. Yeah, which I think really sort of sums it up. I mean, you talked about civility. Most people are wearing their masks. Some people are not. But people are being very respectful and just very happy and embracing of one another on Times Square, which is huge at this particular time. Yeah, they're... You feel it. The, the, the joy is palpable out there. 20 so a few, a few things about this. Uh, one is, yeah, of course, they're there's being civil to each other. They're all Democrats. They're all on the same team, although there was some 
BLM Biden voter or Biden supporter friction over the weekend in one place. But yeah, they're all on the same team. Do people at Trump rallies start arguing and punching each other? No, of course not, because right? they're gathered there in unity around that issue. So I just think it's funny. Oh, well, they're being nice to each other. Yeah, because it's all Biden voters. Uh, so, of course, they are because they're all they're all happy about this. But I'm sorry. It's it's increasingly impossible for me to hear with without wanting to scream uh, four letter words that I can't say on the radio. It, it's impossible to look at this stuff and just see the difference that with the, that the media treats, say, a Trump rally from a massive gathering of Democrats right outside the White House. And they say, oh, Buck, it's spontaneous. No, it's not. It's organized by people online. Let's stop this. Oh, it's all just spontaneous. All the protests, all the riots, it's all spontaneous. That, that's just another way of saying no one can be held accountable for this. It just happened, man. It just sort of happened. Fake Tapper, perhaps best known recently for tweeting out a photo of himself with a mask alone in his office, mask on, of course, saying this is what adults do. No, it's what people who are uh, paranoid and obsessed with virtue signaling, that's really, Tapper isn't actually as worried about the virus as he is about people on the left and the Democrats loving one of the last fake journos to still claim the, uh, the, you know, just telling the truth, speaking to power mantle. Give me a break. But here he is in his once a month, once a month, he, he calls out something that his own side's not going to like, but it's all part of the brand enhancement. It's, ne- it's really never more than that. It's like once a month, he's like, well, maybe I don't like this thing that a Democrat did because there's a little bit of hypocrisy. And it's always blaring hypocrisy. It's always something that's so obvious. And then a lot of, a, a lot of uh, you know, moderate Republican types in the media go, oh, yay, look, he's saying a nice thing about... That's the whole game, don't they see it? That- it's not, they're just not very clever. Um, but here he is, fake Tapper, calling it out. He's, he's seeing what we're all seeing with these celebrations in the street. Play seven. I know, uh, at least based on what we saw on screen, a lot of these people were wearing masks, but not all of them were. And CDC guidelines say either, e- even if you're wearing a mask, you should avoid crowds. New coronavirus cases are soaring. We've just had some of the worst days for new infections of the entire pandemic. Is it incumbent upon President-elect Biden to make it clear to his supporters that crowds are a bad idea during this pandemic, even if people are wearing masks and he understands that they want to celebrate, but they shouldn't be filling the streets like that? The answer is, of course, they're not going to say that. They're going to wait maybe until they've had their fill of parties for a couple of for like a week or two. And then they'll put out some statement. Hey, everybody, we take the we believe the science. We take it seriously. So. Well, now that you've had your fun for a couple of weeks and you don't really care about having street parties anymore or block parties, uh, you know, don't do that. That's what will happen, right? I mean, look, I I always, you know what they're going to do. You know how they're going to play the game. But it was so noticeable. Here in New York, uh, where I am, all day Saturday, it was just cars honking everywhere. It was a a stunningly beautiful day. It was over, it was like 70 degrees in New York City, which in November is, is rare. Absolutely gorgeous day. And, uh, you know, they're, they're doing this very festive atmosphere out there on the streets. And, yeah, people are wearing masks uh, mostly, although I saw more people without masks than I have in a very long time. But they're gathering in huge crowds in places. And, you know, you're, you're not allowed to have your kids in school still in a lot of cities. You're not allowed to go and sit in a restaurant normally. I had to fill out. So while all the Biden folks are running around in, in big crowds on the street and they're cheering and they're shouting and they're having this great time, I sit down to have a coffee uh, with my girlfriend and inside and we have to fill out test and trace information. How the, how the hell is that going to be useful for anything? I mean, we, we, are just, we are just getting drawn deeper and deeper into the tyranny of these morons every day. And it's going to get worse now, too. You're going to have two things go on. It's going to be moving in opposite directions, which is it's a cognitive dissonance, but Democrats excel at cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, they're going to be trying to tell you that everything's going to be getting better because of Biden. But there's also going to be this not yet. We got to double down. We got to triple down. We got to have you know, more masks, more of all this stuff. And they're going to be saying, but don't worry, Biden's got it. But, oh, we got to get more severe, more severe. And so he'll be both the savior 
and the uh, the taskmaster for us on on COVID. So he's going to make things more strict while at the same time telling us that everything is getting better, but we need to have all these more extreme measures because that's how he's going to fix it. Uh, it's it's going to really drive me nuts. I, mean, I, I actually was on a treadmill yesterday with a mask on, and I'm just sitting there, and, and I'm, there's two other people in the gym, and I'm like, the chance of me having COVID or these two people around me having COVID is like one in... I think numerically it's around one in 10,000 or something like that. And I have to sit here and I can't breathe normally because idiots all across the country who have been, who have been fed this nonsense about how, oh, the mask is, is such great protection. You have healthy people. You have millions and millions. You have tens of millions of entirely healthy people walking around constantly now with masks on. Uncomfortable, not able to breathe normally. Tens of millions of them. Healthy. There's no reason for them to be doing this. But, you know, oh, we can't know. We can't know because our risk tolerance has turned into basically zero. And they did it. It was all political manipulation. Right? And, and now we've gotten used to doing what we're told to do, even when it makes no sense. And they're going to continue to use that for their own benefit. They're people who like control. They like to control others. I want to leave people alone and let them just live their lives as long as they don't infringe upon my life and, you know, obey the law and fulfill their contracts. It's like, leave me alone. Let me do my thing. You, you do your thing. No. Libs are the party of school moms and hall monitors that are always saying, you're, you're 20 seconds late to class. Go to detention. That's the world we're going to be living in with COVID-19 measures for at least the next 12 to 18 months. I recently got a crash course in home title theft. You better pray this crime never happens to you. It goes after your most valuable asset, your home. Here's how it works. Your home's title, believe it or not, it exists online. It's in the cloud, it's stored on servers. The bad guys, cyber thieves, they hack in and then they use a quit claim deed to kick you off, put themselves on your home's title. And you often don't find out about this until you get a payment demand in the mail, perhaps even a foreclosure notice. You have to create a virtual barrier around your home's title with Home Title Lock. Just go to HomeTitleLock.com, use the promo code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. You can also check online to see if you're a victim of this crime and don't even know it, which does happen to people. So you need to go right now, create that virtual barrier around your home's title with HomeTitleLock.com. Don't wait until this crime possibly ruins you financially. Take action today. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code RADIO. Our work begins with getting COVID under control. We cannot repair the economy, restore our vitality, or relish life's most precious moments, hugging our grandchildren, our children, our birthdays, weddings, graduations, all the moments that matter most to us until we get it under control. On Monday, I will name a group of leading scientists and experts as transition advisors to help take the Biden-Harris COVID plan and convert it into an action blueprint that will start on January the 20th, 2021. That plan will be built on bedrock science. It will be constructed out of compassion, empathy, and concern. I will spare no effort, none, or any commitment to turn around this pandemic. Yeah, notice how they're a little light on specifics, aren't they? What are they going to do to stop this? We'll get into the vaccine a little bit. Biden and Harris have had nothing to do with any vaccine development of any kind. So that's not that. But what's the plan going to be? More testing, more tracing? Tracing is a joke. People who bring this up are just honestly not very smart or don't know anything about this issue. You're going to, you're going to trace 100,000 cases a day? Really? How? What does that even mean? And then I always want to say, well, hold on. If you only test, if you only trace cases where somebody was indoors for 15 minutes or more with somebody with a positive case, uh, does that mean that we can all stop wearing masks for the 15 second walk from our table in a restaurant to the bathroom like morons? Can, can we do that? No. Bedrock science. Sure. What's the bedrock science? 
Masks all of a sudden work. You know when they decided masks work too? The influenza pandemic of 1918. You know what it did to stop that? Nothing. But okay. Sure. That's all it's going to be. More mask harassment. Selective mask harassment, by the way. And also uh, social distancing. This was considered by the scientific community, and I'm not going to let this go because I've read the studies and I know this was considered something we would never do. We, we were not going to lock down society over a pandemic. It's counterproductive. It's too, it's too destructive, and it doesn't work. No, but oh, no. You know, they'll, they'll tell us, oh, but the death toll would have been so much higher. And look, I'm going to say, I think that this was, a, this was a mistake for the Trump administration to always say, oh, we would have had two million die. I understand the politics behind this, but the media won this narrative where, oh, if only Trump had done more, then we could have gotten the death rate even lower. What were they going to do? What were they going to do? It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but the test and trace stuff, you know what they are going to do? They're going to create a massive, a massive health bureaucracy. In addition to the one we already have for, for pandemics, this is going to be the, the big push. You know, we already have the CDC. We have the NIH. We have, we have, I, mean, I can't even begin to get into all the different health agencies. We've got state and local health agencies. And so much money spent on this stuff every year. And they're going to create a, an additional, you know, this is the Democrat answer to everything. Hire more bureaucrats, make more meetings, and regulations. And then, and then say that you've solved the problem. And then when you haven't in a few years, say, hold on a second, we got an idea. Hire more bureaucrats, make more meetings, create more regulations. And, and then it's just wash, rinse, repeat. They just keep going with that. That's what they're going to do. So I got to tell you, it, it really just drives me, drives me insane. Um, because if, if I believe that, that they had plans that were really going to be helpful in dealing with the pandemic, I'd be all about it. I want my life back. I want people to be able to just live their lives. This is, to me, this is all just, this is all insane. I mean, people have gotten way too used to this new existence where we don't, we don't intermingle. We don't see each other. We're not out there living our lives. We don't travel. And the, the Biden-Harris plan is, listen to the scientists. Let's listen to the scientists. Okay, what are, this, what are these scientists saying? Wear a mask? I know, we get it. We've been told this now a million times for the last six months. We're wearing masks all the time. Our people are always, they're wearing masks. And yet the virus still spreads all over the place, but we're wearing masks. And it still spreads in blue cities. It still spreads in places where, you know, you see everybody walking around with masks all the time. Oh, but even if it doesn't stop it, which we know it doesn't, it limits it. By how much? They don't know. They just say it does. And what they were saying at the beginning of this, which was that, no, you shouldn't wear a mask um, because it's an imposition and it probably doesn't work. You're supposed to. And I mean, like Fauci, people that are supposed to know all about this. Just forget that they said that. Now you're an idiot if you don't believe what they're telling you now because of what they told you nine months ago. Because what? The science has changed. What, what do they know about this now that they didn't know then? In fact, they thought it was much more lethal then, much more lethal than it is. And we had far fewer means of trying to treat it and control it in a clinical setting for people that are actually infected. So what has changed? Oh, the political imperative has changed. The, uh, need that people, the need that people have to think that what they're doing is somehow making everything better. Um, that has changed too. But I'm pretty sure the science has not dramatically changed here. And, you know, given that we had an H1N1 uh, breakout in the past that, you know, killed tens of thousands of people, didn't kill quite as many as COVID, obviously, uh, there, there was never a mask mandate considered then. Why? It's no big deal. It's not that big a deal. They say it's not that much in position. No, I, I say it is. I say it's dumb and the government's making you bend the knee. I don't like it. Let's get some ground truth going here, friends. Sean Parnell is with us now. He was in one of the most hotly contested and most visible congressional battles in the whole country. And it's still contested. They're still counting votes. But he's got some major concerns about what happened in, in his race in Pennsylvania, in the state of Pennsylvania. And then, of course, if this might have been replicated nationwide, 
John Purnell is a former Army Ranger, and he's running for a seat in Pennsylvania's 17th Congressional District. He's with us now. Sean, thanks so much. Hey, Buck. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Let's get right into it. What, what happened in Pennsylvania? I mean, you have your slice of it from Pennsylvania's 17th Congressional District, but what, what are we seeing that, that yeah. gives you a lot of concern in your race and then, of course, across the state for Trump? Well, so I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the timeline on election night as I experienced it. Um, you know, the polls, uh, the polls closed. People started voting. Uh, by the end of the night, I had over a 43,000 vote lead, was up 17 points. Um, Connor Lamb had a press conference scheduled early because I think that he thought he was going to be declaring victory early. Uh, he had to cancel it. Um, and so we started doing all of our mathematical projections, knowing what we knew about the mail-in ballots that were going to be coming in on the Democrat side of the House and the Republican side of the House and the independents. We figured out that on election night, there was no honest mathematical path for Connor Lamb to win this race. Uh, in fact, we were projecting that we would have over a 13,000 vote victory after all the mail-in votes came in. Uh, then Allegheny County uh, inexplicably said that they were gonna stop counting. This was not part of the plan. We thought they were gonna count all night, uh, but they stopped and they were supposed to resume counting at 10 a.m. Uh, the next day, they did not. In fact, the ranking member of the Board of Elections, a lamb surrogate uh, and a Democrat, an entrenched Democrat, um, started doing a media blitz. Instead of counting the votes, he's doing a media blitz saying, when all the votes are counted, we're confident that Congressman Lamb, lamb will have a two percentage point lead. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of a, a brazen thing to say for your boy who's down by over 43,000 votes. Uh, and so they started counting votes on uh, you know, the day after Election Day at about 2.30, and the race tightened, and we expected it to because uh, Connor had more mail-ins than we did. Uh, so we watched the race tighten. We were still confident that at the end of the day, 13,200-plus vote victory for us. Um, but then at about 8.30 at night, there were two successive ballot dumps, one for 4,000 ballots, one for 9,000 ballots. Uh, that put him over the top. Literally, Buck, 25 minutes after that, Connor already had a press conference scheduled, like rolled out there, declared victory, despite there being military absentee ballots left, provisional ballots left, uh, both in uh, in Allegheny, but also in Butler and Beaver. Um, and I just like to say that that 4,000 ballot dump and 9,000 ballot dump was not part of the calculation at all. We have no idea where they came from. And that number added up to 13,000 people. So we have no idea what's going on. We're trying to get answers right now. Uh, you know, we're combing through the, the voter rolls and, the, and, and those who had requested and returned an absentee ballot. We're finding all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, just in a one hour search, we found probably over like 100 dead people who, who have voted. And yeah, I appreciate the service of Civil War generals, but maybe they shouldn't be voting in the 2020 election. There are problems here. Uh, and, and my concern is, is, is that, you know, I'm fighting for the 200 plus thousand people who voted for me, but also the 200 plus thousand people who did not, Buck, because right now, you know, I've gotten thousands of messages over the last couple of days saying you have to fight this. I'm never going to trust another election in my life. You know, elections have to mean something in this country, Buck. And and for Connor, over over 56 percent of the people that voted for him mailed in a ballot. Over 100,000 people mailed in a ballot. How can we possibly know that the, that those who mailed in a ballot are alive, are resident? are not an illegal immigrant, are not a felon, unless we audit the vote. You know, because every single person that casts an illegal ballot cancels out somebody who cast one legally. So we have, we just, to me, we don't have a choice. We have to audit the vote. And so, so everyone understands Sean, we're speaking of Sean Parnell, former Army Ranger, and he's running in a uh, still very heated contest for Pennsylvania's 17th Congressional District. Votes are still being counted. Sean, uh, the changes that were made to voting in Pennsylvania. Just uh, t tell us, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing univer uh, you know, universal mail-in ballots. We're talking about a three-day lag from the election yeah. to count them. The, yeah, you know, what, are the what are the shifts that were made? 
Yeah, so you know, if you're looking at a mail-in system, Pennsylvania's mail-in system that was developed in the PA state legislature by Democrats and Republicans was supposed to mirror Florida, right? And Florida does a pretty good job of implementing their mail-in system. The results in Florida, in fact, were tabulated on election night, uh, which is in keeping with federal law. Um, but the problem in Pennsylvania, and while I support mail-in voting and certainly the system that Florida has in place, is that Governor Wolf, and Josh Shapiro and the PA Secretary of State removed all of the safeguards for mail-in voting that we would have to verify that a vote is actually accurate. They removed the signature requirement. They removed the deadline. In fact, they extended it. You could you could drop a mail a, a mail-in ballot up to three days after the election with no postage. There's no signature matching requirement. In fact, in, in this election, you don't even have to prove residence in the state of Pennsylvania to vote with a provisional. It So all of the safeguards that would protect the mail-in system on both sides of the aisle have been removed. And because of that, it chaos has ensued over the last couple of days. And, you know, a lot of folks are out there talking about the Supreme Court ruling that, you know, ballots that come in after Election Day have to be segregated. And, yeah, that's certainly a good thing. But guess what? Ballots that were delivered after Election Day because of the governor's ruling don't have to have postage. So. How can you tell? John, what are the irregularities? I, I won't say fraud yet, but the irregularities. And for example, you said dead people voted. I've seen some efforts to try to explain this away as um, this is done to protect the victims of domestic abuse or something, that their, their birth date will be shown as something that's not their real birth. I mean, is there is there any merit to that? What are the actual problems that have been established so far that you've seen in your district in Pennsylvania? Because I think people, if we find fraud in Pennsylvania, first we have to find issues, right? Irregularities, I guess is the word we'll use. If we find actual clear fraud in Pennsylvania, that enormously opens up the playing field for people to look and, and feel like they actually have a, a little bit of, a, of leeway now, a wind at their back, to look for fraud in Michigan, in Arizona, in these states that were so, so tight and just seem fishy. So what can you tell us that you've seen so far that's off about the way these ballots were counted or sent in? Well, well, I mean, dead people for voting for one. I mean, that that's a big deal. But yeah, um, right. But is there any do they have any because that seems like it's, you know, as clear as can be. Do they have some ex explanation for that? As in, is it a glitch in the computer system? Right? I mean, is, you know, is are yeah, there real? I'm just wondering. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. We're 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 looking into that. We have seen some irregularities in nursing home facilities, several in Beaver County, all of Beaver County is in PA 17. Uh, we're, we're looking in, we've got the sheriff in Beaver County looking into irregularities there where, you know, something like 70% of the nursing home patients in that facility both requested and returned a ballot on the same day. Uh, there were 19,000 mail-in ballots in, in Beaver County that were submitted. Uh, it looks like, Buck, now this is staggering, 100% of them went straight party ticket. Now, the reason why that's significant is because in Beaver County, I won Beaver County by like 75-25 on election day. Democrats in Beaver County were coming out in droves for me on election day. Now we're supposed to believe that 19,000 mail-in ballots in Beaver County uh, all went straight party ticket. Now, of course, probably some of them would be party loyalists. Those that would be inclined to mail in a ballot might vote straight party, but all of them. I mean, that's certainly that's certainly unbelievable. Uh, um, but you're looking at you know, so saying in Allegheny County, certainly those two ballot dumps that went almost exclusively for Lamb that weren't a part of our initial projections is something that I would say is anomaly, uh, an anomaly. But also think about this: the Secretary of State's website, you know, as we were watching on election night, was updating ballot information right before the county was right. That process should be reversed. Um, so look, this is the first time that we've ever implemented a, 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 a mail-in or early vote or no excuse absentee voting here in Pennsylvania. Um, I feel like we should make, be, be making sure uh, that, that these votes are audited and actually coming from real people just to make sure, because if we, I mean, honestly, Buck, if we don't, 70 million people in this country are never gonna trust an election again. Are we able to do that? Is the auditing process you think strong enough for, let's just focus in again on Pennsylvania, where you think we can at least get some answers? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, look, my race is a razor thin margin, right? I mean, what, what's going to be relatively simple, and we're doing this now, is is checking, as we already talked about, you know, for for people that have passed away, but also people that are non-residents, um, also people that maybe have, have a felony uh, or or uh, a, a potential legal immigrant. None of those people should be voting. And if that number, the total number of that of, of that group of people exceeds the margin, which is this case in this case is razor thin. I think that brings into question the integrity of the entire election, even if we we don't know or we won't be able to tell uh, who voted for who, right? But if that number exceeds the margin, then how can anybody trust the results, right? So um, these are the things that we're looking at now, and of course, you know, the auditing process it it does it does cost money, and of course, you know, we we we've, we've started an election defense fund for that reason, uh, just to make sure that that we're defending free and fair election, and that every legal vote counts. And if you go to my website, SeanForCongress.co, uh, you can contribute and and help us do that. Uh, but yeah, Buck, we're we're trying to do it. We're trying to defend the election because again, Republican, Democrat, Independent doesn't really matter to me. Uh, I want to make sure people have trust and confidence in our in our system, right? Moving forward, and 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 right now, half the people. I mean, seriously, two hundred plus thousand people voted for me. They don't. Sean, uh, before we let you go, you're a Pennsylvania guy. I know that this wasn't your district, your area. How confident are you that there was intentional fraud going on in Philadelphia? I, I, I'm confident. I mean, I, gosh, I don't, I don't, yeah, I have to be careful. I have to be careful with how I say this, but I mean, there, there, there's absolutely, there absolutely was misconduct. Absolutely. Like there's, there's no, and, and look, it, the, the media is going to say, oh, Parnell is pushing unfounded allegations. It's like, well, look, there are two ways to prosecute a crime with a confession and, and, and a body, or you have to build the case and present the case to the jury. Right now, we're in the process of building the case, right? And there is clear evidence of, of fraud in Philadelphia, uh, fraud here in, in Western Pennsylvania, I would say. And, and right now, uh, we're, we're collecting affidavits from people who would swear under oath uh, to that fact. As to, whether it, it, as to whether or not it's going to be enough to sway the election in either way, I don't know. But I think we have a duty and responsibility to look into it anyway to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen going forward. Sean Parnell, everybody, former Army Ranger and still congressional candidate in Pennsylvania. Sean, you're a man who stays in the fight. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Buck. Big news out today about vaccine development. It seems Pfizer is claiming that it's data so far on a vaccine and, you know, Pfizer, uh, probably the best known or one of the biggest and best known drug companies in the world. Uh, Pfizer saying that their vaccine is 90 percent effective. 60 to 70 percent effective, something in that range would be considered a really, str- a really solid vaccine. They're saying there's a 90 percent effective. Uh, if that's correct and we get this thing distributed, the pandemic, at least this strain of COVID-19 uh, it is going to come to a screeching halt pretty quickly, right? Or maybe it's going to come to a halt pretty fast. Screeching halt, I guess, would be all at once. But it's going to go away. It is going to go away. And this should be cause for universal jubilation. In fact, it would be much more understandable in my mind, not a surprise, if people were outside cheering and dancing in the streets about the imminent vaccine approval and how we can have our lives back then instead of uh, old, uh, out of it, just clown Joe Biden. I can't believe that they, this guy they think is going to be the president. <clears throat> it's still, <laughs> it's still amazing. Joe, Joe Biden is a, is a third tier mind and a fourth tier politician. He's about to be president of the United States. What, what a remarkable thing this is. Got it done where Hillary couldn't. At least that's what they're saying. I know we're, it's not over yet, but you know what I mean. Uh, anyway, the vaccine should be cause for universal celebration. Uh, but he, here's what I'm going to tell you right now. This becomes the narrative. And you're not going to want to hear this, but you need to hear this. Joe Biden and Kamala beat the pandemic. 
they're going to be in office. This is the narrative. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but if they're in office and if, if they take office as they're currently planning to, there will be distribution of a vaccine that is part of Operation Warp Speed. One, there's several vaccines, any one of them, part of Operation Warp Speed, and they will, uh, they will claim that it's because of how great Kamala and Joe Biden are that the vaccine is out there, and, and now you're, and you're going to start to see deaths go down dramatically. I mean, once you get this stuff out to seniors, I mean, if you just get COVID vaccines to every nursing home in the country, for example, and, and everyone over 65 with a, a comorbidity or a, a comorbid health issue, you're going to see the death rate just start getting chopped. I mean, the day-to-day deaths from this are going to start getting chopped down, which is fantastic. Look, it's great. I just want us to not have COVID anymore. It's not, it's not political for me. I just don't want COVID anymore. I want this gone. I want us to have normal life back. And I want as many lives saved as possible between now and when we can finally stop thinking about this stupid China virus. It's ruined the world for, for a year. Um, but the Democrats are going to take full, full credit for this. If Biden take, I, I, you guys understand, I don't I think that Biden, there's still a fight here and it's not a done deal, but I, I'm going to be talking about this sometimes like, well, right now the expectation is Biden is going to be taking, taking the presidency. Uh, if, if they're in that position, you're going to see Joe Biden talking about how it, it'll be like he was in a lab coat in the basement the whole time developing the vaccine himself. Just get ready for it. 